Today is February 13th, 1985. This is Joe Todd, an interview with Mr. Walter W. Roberts. Sir, where were you born? Buffalo, Oklahoma. And when's your birthday? March 27th, 1924. Who's your father? Archie Roberts. And your mother? Ellen Roberts. Ellen, what was her maiden name? Arnie. Arnie. A R N E Y. E Y. Where were they from? Uh, she was from Camargo. And I would say if he was originally, he was born in Iowa. Mm-hmm. What kind of work did your father do? He was a farmer. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. mm-hmm. When did your father's family come to Oklahoma? Any idea? No. Gosh, I don't know. It was 19, 12, 13, I don't know, in there, someplace. Where's your father's farm? Where's his what? Well, where, where was your father's farm? farm? Say, your father was a farmer? Yeah. Well, where'd he farm? Uh, out northwest of Buffalo. Northwest of Buffalo? Mm hmm. Is that where you were born? I was born in Buffalo. Okay. How big was the farm? Oh, he had around 3,000 acres. What kind of house did you have when you were a kid? Two story house. What, wood? Yeah. Wood frame? What kind of chores did you do in the farm when you were a kid? Chores? Yeah. Me, I was raised in town, to be right honest. So oh, okay. Until I was kept to be with that breaking over age of 12. Uh, from there on, it was running tractors and building fence and things like that. Mm-hmm. What was your main crop on the farm? On the Wheat. Wheat. Mm-hmm. How many acres of wheat did you have? Well, approximately a thousand. How many acres of wheat could you plant or drill in a day? Now? No, then. When you were first started working on the farm, oh, I'm when I was out there old enough to see it. They was drilling with two to three drills, so the year the acres in the day would be approximately. You'd go a little faster, but it'd be approximately what you drill a day. Mm-hmm. What a couple hundred? No, I would. I'd hold out within a hundred. Hundred? Because your days are shorter than you. It's 200 acres a day or something else. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is that uh, winter wheat? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about wheat harvest? Did you, your father, always have a combine? Did you remember? Mm-hmm. Was it? Pulled by horses, or was it gasoline powered? It was gasoline powered. Okay. What brand was it? Case. Case. L38, and then an international. Mm-hmm. We always hear now Chalmers. The one with the little ones, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When did you start school? Oh, I guess 1930. And did you go through high school? Got out in 42. Oh, just right for the war. Yeah. Um, how did the Depression affect you and your family in the 30s? Oh, 
So this is just about like it is today. <laughs> I don't know what you what really answer there. I mean, if you was, because most of everybody made it, you know, they had plenty to eat. Mm-hmm. What, you raised most of your own food? Uh, no, they, Mom had a little garden, but they had the cow, and they had butchered your meat, and, and uh, that's just kind of the way it was. I mean, it wasn't, I couldn't really see that it was all that much. Outside of you could see some good dirt storms. Tell me about the dirt storms. Uh, well, they just a big cloud of dirt. And I mean, we used to get out there and take an old canvas or something, make sail out of them, and try to let them pull them as long in as the wind, you know. They'll just got to run this job past time, you know, as kids. Mm-hmm. What about Black Sunday, the big one, in 35? Well, I, really the worst dirt storm I ever remember came during the, well, I was going to school. And, uh, we all, to put it all in perspective, the wind came in, the dirt came in. And then it came in, uh, it also had a scare because they had some of these wholesale houses on gasoline and they had a fire scare down there, or got a, had a little fire around one of them. That's the one I remember more than the Black Sun Mirror. Mm-hmm. What were you doing on Pearl Harbor Day? I know I was listening to radio. And saying, well, uh, the war will be over before we ever get in, you know, <laughs> at that age. We, I put you, I thought. Mm -hmm. Did you enlist or were you drafted? Warren? Did you enlist or were you drafted? I went to college and then I was enlisted to stay in school. And that lasted one semester. Where'd you go to college? There's still water. Still water? Mm hmm What'd you major in? I get coming. You going 42? 42. Mm -hmm. Was there any organized efforts there to support the war effort at Stillwater at the college? Like any big bond drives or? Oh, I, I really couldn't answer that, because mm -hmm. I can't, uh, you know, I couldn't recall that. Yeah. So you went in service in 43? Yeah, week before, well, we missed the semester test, and the end of the final test, we didn't have to take them, we enlisted. Oh, well, there during the winter. That's the only way we could stay in another semester. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go to basic? Camp Maxley. In Paris? What? Well, in Paris, Texas? Yeah. I'm surprised you heard of it. What was basic like down at Maxley? Well, let's just say I, I've never been back to that country. And it's not all that far from here. How big is Camp Maxie? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. All I know it was filled up with... We was taking basic and we was all boys out of college in the Ace Service Command. Well, you, you had the... What rifles were you drilling with? What weapons? Well, I guess Springfield. Springfield, no free? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What time did, would they get you up in the morning there at basic? I think six. 
I think that's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty standard army procedure. Yeah. And they'd run you all day long, and what time would you get to bed? Oh, we'd get off six, seven, and it was kind of up to you when you went to bed. Mm -hmm. How did they teach you to fight the Germans, the Japanese, whatever? What'd they do? What kind of training did they give you? Oh, they have lectures, and then you have your bayonet drill and your obstacle courses. And that is about it. How long did that last? Well, we lasted, it lasted all summer, three months. Mm -hmm. We was in three months, basically. And where'd you go? Uh, Sam Houston State Teachers College, ASTP. So Huntsville, Texas. I would say Huntsville. Yeah. What'd you do there? Army Specialized Training Program. What'd they train you to be? Engineers. What, combat, civil, what? No, this is just schooling. Just schooling. And engineering subjects. Hmm. What'd they have in mind for you? Well, you really want to know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, most of them stayed two semesters, but I couldn't handle the math, so I transferred to Air Corps. But they, they really had in mind that that was, you know, they was going to send to school just like a doctor or anything. You know, the doctors would enlist, they'd send them to medical school or anything like this. But that was they, but when they got short of men, when they called every one of us in. So they're going to make an engineer out of you? Well, I presume, but you know, you never know. He's going to have engineering courses. Mm -hmm. So you transferred to the Air Corps? Yeah. What position? What? As a cadet. Cadet. Where'd you go? Uh, this is pre-cadets, mind you, because they didn't, I went to Shepherd Field. I went to Stout Falls, and then I went to transfer to the Arizona State, to Tempe, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And what did you train to be in the Air Corps? Pre-cadet. Now what's pre-cadet? This was a schooling you take before you actually would become a cadet. Cadet, you started in on the, uh, where you'd go to a regular flight school. Oh, you're going to be a pilot then? Yeah. And what did you do in Tempe at Arizona State? Well, we was taking the practice same. We was taking college courses just like we was at, in the ASTP. And how long did you stay at Tempe? Oh, about about four months. I think it was about April when I came out with that order that everybody who had been in the ground forces would be transferred back into the ground forces. And you go to the ground forces then? Went down to Brownwood, Texas. What happened then? Well, they gave us uh, more training and armored infantry outfit. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You go overseas? Yeah, that fall I was shipped out and was a replacement overseas. Where'd you ship out from? Embarkation? Mm, New York there, someplace. Just in New York. And anything happened on the trip over to Europe? No. Just typical life on a British ship. I mean, there was no combat, if that's what you mean. How many men on the ship? I would have no idea. There was a lot of them though. Yeah, how long did it take to get over? About uh, either 10 or 12 days. It went by itself. It didn't have, it's fast enough it wouldn't go in the, it's a big luxury liner, that's what it was. Fast enough it wouldn't have, need any convoy. Wasn't the QE, was it? Queen Elizabeth? No, 
but there was a there was a ship or two right down there that was, yeah. and I can't recall their names now. What part of the ship did you stay in? So far down, I thought it was about a hundred foot up the water level on the outside. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it was in the hold. Mm -hmm. You get seasick? No. Hmm. Where'd you land? Uh, Liverpool, England. And what'd they do with you? Oh, I just... We just laid around, you might say, so we, they shipped us over to France. And did you I, they also shipped us over there on the British ship. Yeah. Uh, the main reason I'm missing this is because they didn't feed the enlisted men on the British ships. So. They didn't feed the enlisted men. If you're an officer, you ate like a king. But if you're down in the hole, you didn't eat very good. What did they feed you? We had two tubs like you would put out on, uh, like you wash dishes in, you know, two of these. And one of them was dried apricots and the other one was some old fat. And that was probably for 30 men. But they would go around because nobody, we went up and bought a carton of can of chocolate bars. <laughs> That's how we made it. <laughs> Where'd you land in France? Oh, I think Omaha. I'm, I'm just, just a beach there. I don't know. Just was this after D-Day? Yeah, it was after D-Day. Yeah. Okay. When was this that you landed? I'd say it was in October sometime. Was there still a lot of debris from D-Day left over? Yeah, they had still had a lot of areas where the mines was there and got them cleared down. Mm -hmm. That is on the land, not the water mine, I don't know. And after you landed Omaha, what did you do? Well, we went to a, a place where we waited to ship out there in France. And they, we, I don't know, we must have laid around there two weeks and they put us on a Forty bait. And it took three days, day and night, traveling on this good train. Go approximately hundred miles into in the Belgian. Where did we? No, we went into Hurling Holland, that's where we was. But this probably wasn't over 100 miles. Mm -hmm. But three days and three nights. <laughs> that took so long. That's just the way the travel was <laughs> over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was cold. We managed to burn a hole through the floor of the boxcar, so you know it was cold. You made the front lines? Uh, not there. I laid around her lane and went up to the the 7th Armored Division as a replacement. Went in the 7th Armored Division. They was up with the British in Holland. What was the 7th Armored doing? Well, we went on the line up there. I don't know. Probably about a week when the, the bulge broke out. Were you in the battle of the bulge? Yeah. What happened? Well, they called us out of there, and we traveled all day and all night and arrived at uh, St. Beth. And then we was, was that before the bulge or? As the boat is already going on, but it was, we drove down, they pulled us down there to St. Beth. And from there, they just crossed a little old valley, they put us in line on the, over there. And 
What'd you do? Yeah, we last stayed there probably on the line there three or four days, maybe five, I don't know, but uh, seemed like we had plenty of support, but they, our tanks came up and went across the open field and fired it over the net timber, and uh, then they came back, and the next thing we know, we just got off. But our tanks, we didn't know what happened to them. You were cut off? Yeah. What, by German tanks or what? No, it was, uh, uh, you could hear firing. It was, they'd come in behind us. You see, this is not just steady woods. You'd have an open area, then you'd have a clump of woods here. Then you'd have a, maybe an open field. And we was in the edge of the woods looking out on the open area, but there were some roads coming down over their backs going into St. Beth, and that was where the, we moved out. To, well, they radioed and said that they was uh, they was pulling out during the night. So anyway, we pulled back to know another open area. And approximately 11 o'clock or something, 10 or 11, uh, 22nd of December, well, we surrendered. How about the surrender? Who gave the order to surrender? Uh, actually there was no order to surrender. This was a kind of a, there was people there, you know, from all our infantry companies, plus our sergeants, and not too many officers. There was a major there from, uh, I believe, uh, engineering battalion that had been cut off several days and he showed up there but we would uh, we looked across the valley going into St. Beth and we noticed uh, uh, looked like a company or two companies of uh, German infantry going into St. Beth and they pulled in a big on the railroad track there in the valley they pulled in a big long one of their biggest guns railroad gun and it didn't look like a very good place to be trying to, that we knew we had to go that way. And uh, it looked kind of like it was a bad place to go. Did the Germans know that you were there? Well, they sent their patrols. This is the way that they, we surrendered because they came through the wood. They'd sent uh, their infantry through the wood. No, we could have probably held out, mind you. But it's the end of the season, it's you never know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And how did you surrender to the Germans? What? Well, we just destroyed our, you know, tore up our weapons and then scattered them and then... How did you, you make contact with the Germans? What did you do? They came through the woods and they hollered handy ho, and we handy hoed. What's that mean? Hands up. Oh. In German. And they had, uh, and uh, it wasn't no big part. We was a lot more than they were. Some of our guys would have got away, too, mind you, because they'd hid out there in different areas, but the civilians there also turned them into the Germans. So this was in Belgium, mind you. But How far were you from where they shot the Americans? I... Would suspect, oh, 10, 12 miles probably. And what was your feelings when you were surrendering to the Germans? What, what were you thinking? I had no thoughts on it. That's the only, looked like the only way out. Mm -hmm. Because we had also picked up on our half track radio. Somebody was brought to, you know, where they was attacking, uh, where the paratroopers were, Bastogne. Yeah. 
and uh, they was calling this off just like a they a football announcer would call off. You know, just play by play. Only it was with the rifles and one thing, guns get fired. Hmm. What did the Germans do with you when you were captured? Well, they lined us up. There's quite a group of us too. And they started marching, and uh, very little time we went through their lines, mind you. They, they, we didn't have that, that much depth behind them, but we went. Uh, we just kept walking. They just kept walking us. And they always promised to feed us the next place down the line. How long did they march you? I think six or seven days. I, I can't, it's not. It's too vague right now, you know. <laughs> And what did they take you to? Well, the first place they took us was a big old, looked like a railroad yard or something, but it was the place where they just kept us overnight. And uh, we finally hit a little village where we was put on a train. And this. Uh, our worst problem there, outside of not, no food, I mind you. We had one bowl of soup on all this time. And uh, we had uh, we'd gone from, when we was on this, well, it was American bombers, really, American planes. It was the weather cleared and they started uh, bombing and strafing, and we was under that. Maybe you were bombed straight by the Americans? Well, yeah, because we was being marched through some of their villages and they couldn't tell who was down there, you know. Any of the Americans killed or injured in the... No, we wasn't. Yeah, the other was some on the train when they strafed the train. There were some guys killed on that, but that was because it was moving trains, you know, they would mm -hmm. bound to get it there. And the biggest shock was we went and got up there to the Rhine, and we'd been reading the Stars and Stripes, and there was no way they could go across that Rhine because all them bridges was bombed. But they showed us one where we walked over one of the biggest, prettiest bridges you ever did see at Coblenz, and. Uh, You know, but we was out. We wasn't on the train then. Mm -hmm. How far do you have? To, how long do you have to march to the bridge and march across the bridge? Uh, I really don't know. Right now. How many men were with you while you were marching across the bridge? How large was the group? Well, it seemed to me like there must have been a thousand of us. Mm -hmm. Where'd they take you? Well, we went eventually ended up at the, uh, one of the Stalags, 4B, I believe. Where is that? I've been to an XPOW convention and have a map at the house showing all them POW camps over in Germany, but I, all I know it's, I don't know right now. Mm -hmm. How big was the prison camp? How many prisoners were there? Huge. I'd say 20,000. Hmm. Um, how many compounds there? Any idea? How many? I wouldn't, uh, well, really, they didn't. Being an enlisted man, well, you know, only they put us out on a, what is it, what is it, working deal. What kind of work do you have to do? Well, they shipped us out of there, and we went to, Zeta, which is right on the Czechoslovakian border. How long are you at the big prison camp? Oh, I would guess two weeks, but that's 
What kind of buildings they have there at that camp? Oh, kind of big wooden buildings, kind of like these army buildings you'd see around these, these surplus army buildings, mm -hmm. you know, they had there on these campuses. Mm -hmm. How many prisoners in each building? I have no idea. They're just big and they're full. What kind of food they give you? That was a dream. Didn't feed you very good? No. Have any shower facilities or anything? I never took a shower there. Our main occupation was talking about food and how to cook it. How does it feel to be hungry? Just like that. You think of, the main thing you got on is you'd be talking about how you can cook this, and which I couldn't cook at all, but you think of all them recipes, you know. Just thinking about it. Yeah. Hmm. Now, when we got to our working camp, we had the issue of one bowl of soup and one. Issue of one bowl of soup and. And uh, it was thin soup and one little piece of bread, about. Oh, it would be about two inches wide and. I don't know, three inches or four inches across. I am in it. There's thick soup in the evening and then what was left over would be in the morning. What kind of work are you doing down by the check border? Uh, they had us working on a siding on a railroad track, building for an air gauge, just digging out the dirt. And what was your average day there in that prison camp? Like what time would they get you up? Around five. And any, what, what kind of meals for breakfast and all that? That was the thin soup and that bread, piece of bread. What time do you go to work? Around seven, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you work all day? Worked all day. What, you, you were preparing the bed for the railroad or what? Yeah, we was, they was digging down, they was going to run the siding, they had a little narrow gauge railroad with a little old, I call it a toy engine, little old cars, and you had to take pick and shovel and, and fill them little deals up with dirt and mm -hmm. take it out. How late was your work? Well, well, I think six o'clock in the evening. How big was that camp? This was probably two to three hundred men, though. Mm. Uh, same kind of buildings as the other one? Yes, yeah, so they just wooden buildings mm -hmm. with a straw mattress. You have beds to sleep on the floor or what? We slept on a straw the mattress. They just had wood deals under them and straw on them. And we had lice, too. Um, any shower facilities there? Yes. You have a chance to wash clothes? Yes, we could wash your clothes, but you didn't have nothing to put on while you was washing them. Which is a little difficult, you know, you had no changes. What time of year was this? This is in January. Kind of chilly, that. February, <laughs> you know. Actually, we're talking about a period of time here from December 22nd. From, well, when we got down there, we're talking about uh, May the 6th or 7th, long in there when the mm -hmm. guards disappeared. How did the guards treat you, the prison guards? Oh, I guess so, right? I mean, I'll say this though, I mean, there was three of them, of our boys, tried to escape, made it the first time, they could have took them downtown and put them in jail, and they looked a lot rough when they come back, uh, and the next time they took off, they shot them.
Then they brought him in the yard and laid him there all day. Hmm. Was that, which camp was that? That was at Zito. Um, I, just, I don't recall whether he had a name or not. Mm -hmm. Or it might have been 4B. That might have been where they killed 4B. How long were you there at the check border? Oh, uh, well, it was probably till, well, till the war was over. So the whole time you spent working on that railroad? Back mm -hmm. We had one day or two we done seen that at another place. What was the chain of command in the prison? Among the Germans and the prisoners? What? Uh, we had no uh, chain of command, but the, whoever the, whatever they were top officers, and I, I kind of played in Germany at that camp was a, was a sergeant. I don't mm -hmm. believe they wasted uh, uh, an officer on, the, on them. Um, what about the camp commandant? Who was he? He was the one I was talking about. Oh, the, being okay, about the, okay. About a sergeant. He was the highest ranking prisoner. Oh, well, now we was all just privates. Just know. privates? Yeah. Dog face soldiers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have any news about the war while you were in prison camp? Well, we, they came in and announced when Roosevelt died. And they came and they gave us a letter. I got that letter too. It was uh, asking us to join the army and fight the Russians. And uh, the, we could tell how the war was getting along with them on the Russian front because we could hear them right over in Poland for the guns, you know, for the probably the last three months. Mm hmm. When did you know the war was really winding down? Well, we went from, they really didn't say any particular time. Oh, we know that, uh, now we saw, uh, you got to see at least a battalion or maybe two battalions. German troops going towards the Russian front in, in this little town, is it though? And they was outside their non coms, they were one of the oldest boy in there, didn't look like he was 15 hardly. And, uh, but we was, uh, they never, we just knew it was about over. I mean, because they was. Well, there's just no way of knowing for sure, you know. Mm -hmm. We had no radio. Or... When were you liberated? Uh, when they turned us loose, they just walked us over this little hill, this little, well, I call it a little hill. It wasn't really it's in the Czechoslovakia, and the guards just disappeared. So they marched into Czechoslovakia? Yeah. And then we proceeded to hitchhike on into Pog Jacobacchus. And actually got back to the well, was British lines at Hills in Czechoslovakia. What were your reactions when you first saw the Allies, the British? Well, I should fill you in just a little here. Okay. Well, three of us had kind of separated, and we hitchhiked with a Russian armored uh, medical deal down there, part of the way. Then we got a ride down the various way, get in Pilsen. And we was in Prague whenever the Beans, President Beans, came back from Russia to, to re enter his country. And there was an American major there. Who was supposed to uh, was going to interview him, and uh, 
we went from we stayed around there and then they we got they give us they put us up in one of the nicest hotels I'd ever stayed in in practice to this day lice and all mind you but from there they they there's still sniping going on there and uh, some of these towns they was having court for some of these Germans too mind you the civilians we went to but we went in the they they furnished the open touring guards and a couple of checks that was good for guards and drove us to Pilsen because we I carried a handwritten deal for they needed medical supplies for really. And I take them in the, and we got to the end of the British court commander at Pilsen, which was uh, kind of upset him because he thinks they could find their court command, you know, that fast. But then we went around to the, where there was American troops, and, and the surprise, there wasn't no surprise, the surprise was we couldn't get any food off of them. How come? They wasn't issued any food for us to come to supper. So what'd you do? So we scavenged around like we'd been doing. And uh, we went and uh, well, they flew us out of there. And uh, I believe the next day or something like that. At Czechoslovakia? Yeah, they flew us to their coast of France. And when did you come back to the States? Oh, we laid there. Must have been three weeks. Now Eisenhower, the only reason we got out, I think, then, Eisenhower came over and gave us a talk and said we'd be on the next boat. And sure enough, the next day we was on a boat. So Eisenhower was, yeah. came over and talked to you. Yeah. What did he tell? What did he say to you? He just told him that we was going to be going home. That by all any possible means, next day they had a boat for us. How come you stayed there three weeks? What was it? No transportation out of there. Hmm. Did I? And then that, then we had a little problem. There's a lot of us get yellow jaundice and stuff from eating, you know, eating richer food. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes it was just as well they were close to the latrine. And when did you come back to the States? What port? Newport News, Virginia. What's the first thing you did when you hit the States? Not a great lot, they wouldn't let us do a great lot. <laughs> do you have yellow jaundice? Well, for a while there, it, it uh, then, uh, but they would, they would not let us kill a call out of there. Mind you, they, you know, you were supposed to have all your records with you, they knew all about you, depending on that damn. And, we had to take all them tests over. They, and as we did that, after the, they practically had to induct us again in the army, you might say. Did you folks know that you were a prisoner? Yeah. Well, they tried to say you got a letter. Well, they got it. Uh, they had got a letter from me, I believe, before they received the word from the War Department. Mm -hmm. mm. mm. When did you get to discharge? Day before Thanksgiving, 45. November 20... Whenever that Remember, was. this is Thanksgiving, this is not Thanksgiving. But this. Right. So I can't tell you. Mm hmm And after you discharge, what you do? 
I went to college for to my finish that. Back to Stillwater? Yes. The GI Bill? Yes. What, back in agriculture? Yes, that's the way I finished in. Mm -hmm. You stay on campus or off campus? Stay stayed on campus. Well, I, I was in the AGRs, and it was a block off campus, but I mean, we, I don't know whether you'd consider that on campus or off campus. Because mm -hmm. I thought they'd been up there then. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you graduated what year? Still what? Oh, January 49, midterm. Because mm -hmm. I got out of the Army too late to get started until the second semester. After college, what to do? I came back to Army. Been farming ever since? Oh, I went back and picked up a teaching degree and taught school, but just one year. But Where did you teach? Oh, I was elementary. Where? Here? No, Buffalo. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it was farming. Yeah. You married? Yes. Where'd you meet your wife? Stillwater. Mm -hmm. Well, Oh, what's your wife's name? Betty. Betty Ann. Betty Ann, what's her maiden name? Uh, Hammonds. Hammonds. She was from Stigler. Hmm. I did some interviews down in Stigler. Pardon? I did some interviews down in Stigler. You did? I interviewed Hammonds. If I'm not mistaken. I probably wouldn't know any of her relation. I think most of them will tell them that she was. Her mother still lives there. Mm -hmm. You'd probably remember the name of Classy, but you you said you've interviewed probably most of the men, right? So, men and women. Oh, yeah. yeah. What's your mother's first name? Who's? Your wife's mother's first name. Classy. Classy. I've talked to so many, it's all. <laughs> well, anything else? I guess I have three daughters. Mm -hmm. They help you on the farm now? No. One of them's putting in his, one of them's teaching skill, and one's, you know, one's in Oklahoma City working for the, oh, well, um, Heart Association. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them's, Going to school is good. Well, she's married and has two kids, but she's and the other one that's going back. She was did see she and another girl's putting in a they ha, they know how to run a big computer and they're putting in a, they're going for their CPA. So mm -hmm. they said they're going to put in county for them. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh,